Well, today we are considering an outstanding subject and that is to do with who God is and his attributes. Who God is and his attributes. Now, I just need to make this very clear from uh, the very start that the subject about who God is is indeed a vast subject as we are going to consider a number of scriptures to prove my point. So this is going to be a condensed teaching with the aim of clearing some misunderstandings around this subject since God in his word has defined how he should be worshipped and that is worshipping him in spirit and truth as far as John 4 24. The truth is that there is no doxology without theology. This basically means that our theology determines our doxology. Doxology points to the glory. Right theology about this subject results in right worship and failure to know who God is due to mingled and twisted theology results in false worship. God is our true north and if we have a wrong knowledge of God, like the Word of Faith movement, the New Apostolic Reformation movement, and the Prosperity Gospel camp, we cannot fail to end up with a wrong practice. This is why this subject is very important, because it deals with the most important being of all things, and that is God. But as I am talking, the mainstream church has started a strange fire about who God is. That is why things like the little God is doctrine, Christian science, and positive confession have now become the staple doctrines of most of the churches. Today we are seeing a redefinition of that which has already been given unto us in the scripture. The subject has to be handled with a lot of care. That is why even great theologians also attest to the fact that when it comes to the doctrine of God, as far as theology proper is concerned, our knowledge of who God is is limited to that which God has revealed of himself in his written word. Listen to what Romans 11.33 says. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. As if that is not enough, it's also important for us to consider Job chapter 42 and verses 3. It says, Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. So, dear ones, considering those verses, you see that they do point to this rich truth that our God is infinite. That is to mean that he has no limit, he transcends in excellence and glory, but man is finite. We can never fully understand God, and this, in sense, is that God is incomprehensible, in other words, unable to be fully understood. As a matter of fact, when you do consider Psalms 145 and verse 3, it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Now when you also consider Psalms 147 verses 5, it says, Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. It should also be made clear to you, my dear ones, that we can know something about God's love, power, wisdom, and all others. But we can never know his love, power, wisdom, mercy, justice, and other attributes of God completely or exhaustively. What is amazing is that even in the age to come, when we are freed from the presence of sin, we will never be able to fully understand God or anything about him. However, you hear the mammons say that at death they turn into gods. But dear ones, God's incomprehensibility is attributed not to our sinfulness, but to God's infinite greatness. Job 11 verse 7 says, Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? 
The same is true in Psalms 92 and verse is 5. It is also amazing to know that for all eternity, we will be able to go on increasing in our knowledge of God. Psalms 139 verses 17 to 18 says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. It was Stephen Chanock, one of the 16th century Puritans, who said that though angels behold the face of our Heavenly Father, the sense that is communicated is that they see some signs of His presence and majesty, more visual and express than ever appeared to man in this life. But the essence of God is invisible to them and hid from them in the sacred place of eternity. None knows God but himself. No wonder 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 concretizes on the point of Stephen Chanock when it says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The same is true in Romans 11, 33 to 34. So, the depth of the divine essence, perfections, and decrees are unknown to any but to God himself. He only knows what he is and what he knows, what he can do and what he decreed to do. But what I can also say is that in glory, as compared to now, our knowledge of God will be more accurate than now. That is the meaning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the verse is 12, which is commonly known to many people today. It says in verses 12, For we now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So even though we cannot know God exhaustively here, we can know true things about God according to God's revealed truth, which is his word. The point is that all scripture tells us about God is true, as far as the prophetic Old Testament and the apostolic New Testament, which the Holy Spirit inspired Theonustus. Therefore, if we abandon scriptures, we shall fall short in knowing who God is biblically. In the end, we will be wrong about everything. This also means that the knowledge of who God is is very important because that knowledge determines what we believe and how we worship. So, to simply put it, God is the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, unchangeable in his power and perfection, in his goodness and glory, in his wisdom, justice and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. Psalms 90 verses 1 and verses 2 is important for us to cover. It says that from everlasting to everlasting, O oh Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, O oh, ever, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. When we do consider Job 36, 26, this is what it says. Behold, God is great. We know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. So that is why the simple way to illustrate who God is, is to say that God is the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, unchangeable in his power and perfection, in his goodness and glory, in his wisdom, justice and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. So now, at this point, I now want us to look onto the attributes of God. The attributes of God. When we speak of attributes, we refer to the qualities that belong to a person. In other words, 
the attributes are the characteristics of a person or features that usually define a person or a group. Therefore, an attribute is what we attribute to another person. And so when speaking of God's attributes, we are simply referring to his nature, character, his personage, the perfections of God, the essence of God, the being of God, the qualities of God. And among those that we call the attributes of God, we do have what we call the asiati, the spirituality of God, the sovereignty of God, the holiness of God, omnipresence, omniscient, omnipotent, the holiness of God, the knowledge of God, the immutability of God, the truthfulness of God, the wisdom of God, the goodness of God, God is grace, God is love, the foreknowledge of God, the righteousness of God, the wrath of God, the triunity of God, the transcendence of God, the simplicity of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the oneness of God, the mystery of God, the jealousy of God, the eternity of God, and many others. But before we begin to talk about some of uh, the attributes of God and defining them, it should be made very clear that God's being is not a collection of attributes. Let me back up again. It should be made very clear that God's being is not a collection of attributes added together, as if God is some kind of a collection of various attributes added together. The truth is, God's whole being includes all his attributes. They are present in the entire Godhead. That is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is no any attribute that is missing in any member of the Godhead. Whether you are talking about holiness, righteousness, wrath, love, mercy, grace, and others, with the only difference existing only in their roles. And to you that are listening, you need to get this right, that every attribute of God mentioned in Scripture is true of all God's being. A backup again. Every attribute of God mentioned in Scripture is true of all of God's being. They are eternally permanent in the entire Godhead. That is also to mean that each of the attributes have always belonged to God and will always belong to God. He loses none of his attributes and he adds nothing. This helps I and you from never thinking of God's attributes as something external from God's real being. As if attributes are something added unto unto who God is. I have to say this also, that this teaching about the attributes of God is one of the most rare topics or subjects that is ever taught. For this teaching receives less attention in the mainstream church. That is why majority have now formed a God in their own mind after their own image and they worship that God. A God who is not sovereign to do all he pleases. A God who is a servant of his creation. A God that can be commanded to do all that which his creation command of him to do. A God who is only love and not a God of wrath and many others. I promise you by the time we are done with this subject, you will have a true unmixed up knowledge of who God is because the attributes of God define and describe for us who God is as revealed in the scripture. It is also important for us at the very start before we talk about each attribute to establish this point that God's attributes fall in two categories. Number one, there is what we call communicable attributes and second, there is also what we call incommunicable attributes. Now, just to start with the second category, which are the incommunicable attributes. When we speak of incommunicable attributes, we are referring to those attributes belonging to God alone. In other words, they are exclusively belonging to God alone. But these attributes like the sovereignty of God, omniscience, omnipotent, 
and many others, to your surprise and my surprise, is that there are some false teachers who have gone ahead to claim to have access and do possess some of these attributes. Of course, that is silly and uh, it shows how an individual is actually totally uninformed. The word is incommunicable. These only belong, they are exclusively belonging to God alone. But then you'll hear many claiming some of these attributes to be possessing them and to be having an access to them. It's where the mainstream church is today. And there are a lot of gullible followers who believe in these false teachers uh, a lot. But now, speaking of the communicable attributes, we are simply referring to those attributes which are in God, but he also shares them with his creatures in a small measure like mercy, goodness, wisdom, knowledge, and others. So, the ones communicated to us, we do not have them in their full perfection. As in, we can love, we can show mercy, we can show goodness to others, but not as completely as God. And since God's glory lies chiefly in his attributes, let's now consider some of them briefly. Number one, let's begin with what we call the aseity of God. The aseity of God. When you speak of the aseity of God, this actually speaks of our God's self-existence. Aseity is a Latin word which means from himself, from himself, in quotes, from himself, or to have a being or existence within one's self. The reality is made so very much clear to us from John 1, and the verses 4, it says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. In him was life. So our God exists in himself. He is self-sufficient, self-satisfying, self-governing, and self-glorifying. He does not need any part of creation in order to exist. As a matter of fact, Acts chapter 17, 24 to 25 clarifies more on to that point by saying, The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Job 41 and the verse is 11. It says, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So, only God has a CRT. Only God has a CRT. But all men and all other created beings have their existence from God. Acts 17, 28, it says, In him we live, move, and have our being. Dear ones, God does not need us or the rest of creation for anything. And this also brings an end to the common anthem taught and sung in most of the contemporary Christian music. Case in Point Hill song, one of their songs that is known as What a Beautiful Name. One of the lines says, He did not want heaven without us. My dear ones, a God who does not need heaven without us is not a biblical God. For what those guys sing about, that is actually a needy Jesus who is not a biblical Jesus. When you understand the asiat of God, this mindset of thinking that God created human beings because he was lonely and that he needed fellowship with other persons dies because it is false. Our God is completely independent of creation, yet we and the rest of creation can glorify him and bring him glory. Let us look at the second attribute. The second attribute is what we call the eternity of God. God has existed from eternity past and will continue to exist in the eternity future. The Bible makes it very clear from uh, Psalms 90 and the verses 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you 
had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are God. As Wayne Grudem also put it, on court, God has no beginning, end, or succession of moments in his own being, and he sees all time equally, vividly, yet God sees events in time and acts in time, end of quote. To put it simply, nothing precedes God, Isaiah 43.10. It says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. And what is interesting is that man has a beginning and so he will continue to exist in the eternity future in heaven or hell. The third attribute that we also need to consider is what we call the spirituality of God. The spirituality of God. God is immaterial in the sense that God is not with a material substance or God is without a physical body for he is a spiritual substance. John 4.24 says God is a spirit. That is why he is omnipresence. There are no restrictions with him to his presence and knowledge. He is a personal living being and not impersonal. That tells us that God has a personality. And he also has a mind, emotions, and a will. Listen, since God is a spirit, he cannot be seen. Forget the lies of the false teachers who claim to have seen him. Though we have also made it very clear in so many other teachings, that there are no resurrection appearances of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he is invisible because he is immaterial. But that does not mean he is not present. For the scripture is very clear as far as First Timothy 1 and the verse 17. It says, To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The key word that I want to there is invisible he only made himself manifest in the incarnation of christ john 1 14 uh, where the word later on became flesh now you can understand why we ought to live by faith and forget about the lies of people saying that they have actually seen god and god has appeared to them and all of those particular things go to the scripture the scripture says in first timothy 1 17 to the king of ages immortal invisible let us consider the fourth attribute that is the infinity of god infinity god is without end because there is no limitation or restriction on him why because god is a divine spirit being he has no boundaries for he is free from physical limitations he is not limited by time and space he is infinite in his being Job chapter 5 and verses 9 clarifies more on the infinity of God. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? Job 9 and verses 10. Who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number? The same is true in Job 11 and verses 7. It says, Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It's what we mean by him being infinite. He permeates all. A mathematician known as George Cantor, his work on infinity in mathematics was accused of undermining God's infinity. But George Cantor argued that God's infinity is the absolute infinite, which transcends other forms of infinity. Briefly, what I can say about the infinity. Let us also consider God's immensity or what we call God's immense. In that we are saying that our God cannot be contained, 1 Kings 8.27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. 
Let us look at the other attribute known as the sovereignty of God. With this, like we have already concretized in a number of other teachings, what we need to know about it is that God controls all things in heaven and earth and that nothing happens directly and indirectly without his permission and no one and nothing can thwart his will. Isaiah 46 and the verse is 10 makes it very clear for us. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. So, A.W. Pink said that God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases. Let us consider another one, which is known as the holiness of God. The holiness of God. When we speak of the holiness of God, we are saying that our God is transcendent, high and lifted up. He is morally perfect, pure and blameless. Habakkuk 1.13 God is the pattern of holiness. Holiness began with him. Psalms 12 verses 6 or so is important for us to cover here. It says the words of the Lord are pure words like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. That is to mean that God's holiness makes him glorious. Listen, the holiness in God is far above holiness in saints and angels, as actually Stephen Chanock put it. Let us also consider the attribute that is to do with God being omnipotent. In that we are saying that God is all-powerful. God is all-powerful. Or to, to simply put it, God is almighty. God is almighty. Nahum 1.3, it says that the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. So when you do consider, the other one that we can also consider is uh, uh, God being omniscient. God being omniscient. With that we are saying God is all-knowing. And the clear example is actually taken from Isaiah 40 and verses 28. It says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Unsearchable. The other one that is common to us is what is known as God being omnipresent, meaning that God is always present. Psalms 139 and verses 8. David said, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Let us also look on to what we call the immutability of God. That is another attribute of God, God being immutable. With that we are saying that God never changes. God never changes. James 1.17 is very clear on that note. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. That is immutability. He never increases and he never decreases. Numbers 23, 19 also alludes to the same fact and Lamentation chapter 3, verses 23. But I want to quote something from Herman Banvik, one of the renowned theologians. He said that, on quote, it said that although the scripture talks about God changing a course of action or becoming angry, these are the result of changes in the heart of God's people. Numbers 14. Scripture testifies that in all these various relations and experiences, God remains ever the same. So, there is what we call constancy with God. The other one that we should also consider is the foreknowledge of God. The reality being that God's foreknowledge has nothing to do with God learning anything from his creatures for him to act afterwards. He knows the secrets of the heart. His knowledge is instantaneous and unerring, and unerring. Psalms 139 verses 4. 
Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. So at this point, I also want us also to talk about that the triunity of God, as I refer to it as Trinity. God is three persons in one. That is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Distinct, but not separate. And what is very interesting is that the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. And that one is made very clear from Matthew 28 verses 19 that go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The other one that I want us also to consider in the few minutes that we are left with is the one that is to do with the truthfulness of God. Others call it the veracity of God that our God, he is the God of all truth. Whatever he says is true. That is why we believe hell is true, sin is true, heaven is true, salvation is true. Because whatever God says is true. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you do consider Titus 1 and verses 2, it says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before ages began that's the same reality to the truthfulness of god the other one is uh, the one that is to do with god is love first john 4 8 says god is love and scripture speaks of god is love for his son and scripture also speaks of his love being general for his creation matthew 5 45 how he allows his the rain to fall on the land of the just and the unjust and the sun to rise on the land of the good and the evil. And the uh, scripture also speaks of his electing love for his elect as far as Romans chapter 5 and the verses 8. The other one that we also need to consider that many people have made unpopular today to be a part of God's attribute is the one that is to do with God's wrath. The truth is that the truth is that God's wrath is, is a necessary part of his character in his being. For God to love purity, he must also hate impurity. And he must be a God of vengeance and wrath towards all of that which is unclean and impure. The mainstream church has put much emphasis about God's love, but less emphasis has been made about the wrath of God. There's something that happened a few years ago. A certain church in America wanted to add a hymn known as In Christ Alone, written by, written by Keith Getty and Stuart Thousands. But that church had a problem with one of the lines in the song, which line says, Till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And so they wanted to make some change for that line to say, Till on the cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. When they contacted the hymn writers about their concern, Keith Getty and Stuart Thousands said no. My dear ones, you can see some people are distinct in their theology. They say that the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament. But it must be made clear that our God does not change. He is the same in the eternity past and eternity future. He is the same God always and everything he says or does is fully consistent with all his attributes. If God loses any of his attributes, he would cease to be God, which cannot happen for God to lose any of his attributes. And so my dear ones, God's attributes are inseparably interconnected. You cannot divorce anyone from another. Let us also talk about this other one that is also very common to us, and that is God is grace. He's the God of grace because of his free grace. He chose us in him in eternity past and bestowed his salvation on us without any good deed that we contributed. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1. And when you also do consider the book of uh, Exodus chapter 34, 
verses 5 to 6, it says, The Lord descended in the clouds and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Let us also talk about another one that is known as the goodness of God. The goodness of God. Dear ones, God is the final standard of good and that God is and what he does is worthy of approval. He is even good to the unbelievers. Uh, Matthew 5.45 that we alluded to earlier on. Uh, there's also what we call God is righteousness. All his ways are right, are pure. And then there is also what we call the oneness or the unity of God, which refers to, to his being one and only, as it is also made very clear in Anthanasian Creed, which says, we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Uh, there you're able to see Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 which talks about the Shema uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 6 verses 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Ephesians comes again in the New Testament to concretize on the same reality. Ephesians 4, the verse 6. One God, one Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Same is true in Mark 12, 29. Other attributes are the simplicity of God, meaning that God is a simple being and not complex. Another one is the mystery of God, jealousy, and many others. So in conclusion, what we should not forget is that attributes are distinct but non-separate and each attribute works in perfect unity with other attributes. They never conflict with each other, but they all pull in the same direction. So, this is it, dear ones, that uh, we also needed to do what to address, to talk about, and also uh, to share. For many people today, they do not really understand some of these things. This is why we have had a lot of these mingled and twisted doctrines that many people have fed on and desiring particular things which belong to God and seeing themselves as if they have reached and all of that particular thing. When you hear people calling themselves gods and all that, you just know something is wrong with that picture. And if we are wrong about this subject of who God is, we can indeed be wrong in 10,000 other places. So hope uh, this will be a blessing to many of you and I pray that God will use this teaching for his own glory. And to you guys, I want to say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in shalom.